All right. So yeah, can neo-humanism free humanity from emerging totalitarian systems? Well, it's very fascinating to me in the light of the previous presentations to approach this subject. Um, this idea of we're moving towards a totalitarian future. And that idea is coming from many, many different sources. Um, I've, I've even been following people within the financial industry who are starting to see that from their position and their perspective, it's also moving towards centralization, centralized control. Um, we've heard other speakers today talk about uh, money as being a main driver and power, the pursuit of power. And then we took like this quantum leap into this very, very esoteric level. Um, so this presentation is also gonna cover a lot of different layers. Uh, we don't have so much time, but I'm gonna do my best to touch on what I consider to be a very, very vast context um, in terms of our reality today on this planet um, has to be understood in a very, very um, expansive way if we're going to understand what's going on and ultimately um, be victorious in this struggle. Okay, if we go to the next slide. This is a quote from uh, a journalist, uh, Chris Hedges. And I like this quote because it, uh, it says a lot about the state of the world we're in. He's talking about the United States. He's saying, we, live, we now live in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and our banks destroy the economy. You know, that's a pretty damning indictment of this state of uh, the most prosperous nation in the world or one of the most prosperous nations in the world. Something is out of balance here, seriously out of balance. We've heard today in previous uh, presentations of different agendas at work. Chomsky. It's ridiculous to talk about freedom in a society dominated by huge corporations. What kind of freedom is there inside corporations that are totalitarian institutions? You can take orders from above and maybe give them to people below you. So this is looking at the idea that the, the global economic system has become centralized in, in the vehicle of the corporation, the transnational, supranational corporation. This is a quotation from the founder of neo-humanism. So we're going to address some of these, uh, these issues from this neo-humanist perspective. Um, the founder of neo-humanism was P.R. Sarkar. He lived 1921 to 1990 uh, in India. So he, he made a comment about humanism, that it's become a distorted humanism, has created tremendous harm in the world and is still doing so. Those who are motivated by pseudo humanistic strategy utilize this strategy for their own selfish and group interests how to rectify the situation created by these people by taking this distorted humanism towards neo-humanism. So we're gonna now look at what is this neo-humanism? What is the spirit of this neo-humanism that P.R. Sarkar is saying can address the distortion that has come in our world in the form of this distorted humanism. He writes, the universe is mine, all living beings are mine. I am to serve them, I am to help them. I am here to serve them. So he's saying this captures the spirit of neo-humanism. We're seeing the, world, the, the universe as our own. 
that we are part of the uh, fabric of creation. Um, I'm here to help. I'm here to serve. So it's a very, <laughs> it's a very different uh, sentiment there. In this way, if you're fighting against those inner and outer bondages with one hand and serving the universe with the other, your existence will be blissful. I like this quotation because it identifies to me something that's, that's quite important. It, it, it says, firstly, it says, this is a fight. This is a struggle. The world we're in today uh, in, requires that fighting spirit. And that fight is both inner within me and outer. So in the form of inner bondages and in the form of outer bondages. I think that's a very important contribution right there. We often find ourselves focusing on one, ignoring the other. But here it's saying, no, it's, it's at both levels. It's internal, this struggle, this fight to elevate ourselves, uh, to overcome our inner defects, our inner limitations, our inner complexes, and at the same time to break the bondages that have formed in the social world in the social dimension of human existence. When the underlying spirit of humanism is extended to everything, animate and inanimate in this universe, I've designated this as neo-humanism. So you're starting to get, I think, a clear idea of what this neo-humanism humanism is, where the, the inherent rights and dignity of human beings was identified in humanism. Sarkar has taken that category and, and says, expand that to the entire creation itself. He literally talks about the inanimate and animate worlds. This neo-humanism will elevate humanism to universalism love for all created beings of this universe. It'd be interesting to see how people feel about these, these concepts, because in a way, in the light of, of the, the chaos of the times we live in, uh, the brutality of the times we live in, in many ways, this can sound very um, idealistic, but I don't personally think it is idealistic. I think it's actually rooted in, in something very practical and very real. And, and I hope that that can start coming out during the presentation. This idea, all created beings are the progeny of the same progenitor, are members of the same universal family. Okay, so this is the spirit of neo-humanism. You can see in this diagram, we have right down at the bottom the ego self. And as we develop, we expand that ego self to the family where we think not just for our self, we think for our family members. And then as that, de as that individual and that mind develops, it expands to the community level. And from the community level, if there is proper progress and a proper unfolding of that individual, we see this extend to a nation level, the nation state expressed in nationalism. And if that, that inner sentiment can be expanded still further beyond that nation level, we come to the human world. And of course, we would identify that as, as humanism. Whereas this neo-humanist sentiment is the effort to expand that still further to the living world, indeed, the inanimate world, ultimately. A person without a purpose is like a boat without a rudder, Thomas Carlyle. It's identifying here the importance of having a purpose, knowing what our purpose is as a human being, or what our collective pur uh, purpose is as a collective humanity. And without that purpose being clear, we're gonna get into trouble. There is nothing more dangerous for humanity than not, than not knowing its fundamental purpose. 
So it comes to address this question, what is this fundamental purpose? Sarkar was drawing on and basing himself in the esoteric spiritual tradition of yoga of, of India, the ancient yogic system of India. And within that system, there is a word that fundamentally addresses the question of fundamental purpose. That word is dharma. What is our fundamental human purpose? What is the dharma of human beings? And according to the philosophy of yoga, dharma is meaning the fundamental characteristic of an object. So that characteristic so fundamental to something that without that, it can no longer be that object any longer. So something completely innate uh, an innate characteristic. This is this concept of Dharma. So of course, now we are interested in human Dharma. A simple example of Dharma would have been fire. What is the Dharma of fire? Of course, the Dharma, the fundamental characteristic of fire is to burn. If it can't burn, it's no longer fire. So this part's important. What therefore is human dharma? What is that fundamental characteristic of, of human beings? So the yogis said it's human dharma stands on four feet. First point, expansion of the human mind it means human beings want to expand their mind and they can expand their mind. Second point, bringing the human mind in universal flow or in the flow of this universal mind. It's this idea of flow, second point of human dharma, according to the yogis. Third point, selfless service, helping others selflessly. And not only human beings, helping ultimately, you know, the, uh, the living world. Third, uh, fourth point, spiritual emancipation. That's, a, that's something that uh, probably needs some, some elaboration, what's meant by this word spiritual. And we'll do that um, uh, in due course. Okay, this here is a diagram of what that ultimate human purpose is in a diagrammatic form. So it's saying here, the creation is ultimately one cycle. It's a cycle. It's a cycle that has its origins in this concept of supreme consciousness. So the creation comes out of that supreme consciousness, goes through various uh, states of metamorphosis. That is to say, comes into various forms which in its essence is consciousness that has been condensed, that has been crudified or has been metamorphosed. And in the course of that vast journey, human beings arise. Now I've missed out all the details of this cycle of creation <laughs> for the sake of simplicity, but let's, let's accept that at some point in that creative cycle, a developed uh, species arises that we call human beings. And then what this Dharma tells us is the fundamental characteristic of these human beings is to return again to that source from which they came, to return and become one with that supreme consciousness. So that's the cosmological viewpoint of neo-humanism. I've done it very, very quickly here. Uh, within the, the neo-humanist literature, this has gone into an actually considerable detail. The question then arises, if we've accepted this idea of human dharma as being the expansion of the mind, bringing the mind in the flow of the cosmic mind or universal mind, 
pursuing expressing selfless service and ultimately merging back in the source if that is the fundamental purpose or dharma of humans what then is the purpose of human society rather i'd like to say if we can answer the question of of human purpose then naturally we can come to understand the purpose of human society so i think that part's very very important so the purpose of human society to facilitate human purpose to facilitate dharma so that's sort of a logical statement if this is the purpose of human beings then the society is of course to facilitate that at the collective level so at this point we have done something i think quite interesting we have come to a proposition as to what is the purpose of human society to create a dharmic human society a neo humanistic society so that would be one way of expressing uh this idea of uh of neo humanism the challenge for us today is to create a neo humanistic society uh, we can also call that a dharmic human society or simply a genuine human society question arises of course is what is needed to create a genuine human society from this expansive viewpoint Pierre Sarka founder of neo humanism believed there are six factors needed for a society's proper development six factors the first was guide now guide here means remember that earlier diagram where we saw the the cycle of creation we saw human beings occupy occupying a certain quite elevated uh, point in that uh in that circle in that cycle and the movement going to back to that source back to that supreme consciousness so that would be like the grand big picture view and if we're going to accomplish that we're going to need a guide to help us do it that's sort of the big picture challenge so the idea of guide needs to be understood in that context if you're going for the big prize of completing the cycle of creation you're going to need a bit of help along the way that's sort of where this idea of guide uh, can be, be understood second point consciousness practices the word sakar used here was actually spiritual practices um <clears throat> so these are the practices for the all-round development of the human being that the human being is going to be able to realize their dharma they're going to have the capacity to expand their mind to bring their mind beyond their own individual flow and bring it literally into this cosmic flow um and to do selfless service and ultimately complete the creative journey merge back in the supreme so the idea here is to do that you're going to need techniques you're going to need practices and these are what has been referred to here as consciousness practices third point consciousness philosophy you're going to need a philosophy that goes from the most mundane level of our existence to our you know literally our physical existence and extends to the most subtle point of our existence being our pure consciousness that which is beyond the mind itself so i at least to me these are very logical points once you view it within this very big picture view so um we need philosophy that that makes sense of this expansiveness of the grandeur of this cosmological journey that we're we're on fourth point guidelines these are literally the do's and the don'ts again if you can see this in that big picture view 
of returning back again to the source, becoming one with that um, supreme consciousness as source, then of course we're gonna need guidelines. These are not the same as practices. This is much more at the collective level actually. Uh, how we are to live together, how we are to um, move collectively. We will need some rules and regulations to do that. Fourth point, social outlook. This is talking about how we are to view the world beyond ourselves, how we are to relate to one another and the world around us. So again, very logical that that's going to turn up in a list of six fundamental factors for building a genuine human society. We're going to have to have a social outlook, a worldview that's capable of facilitating this marvelous journey through this creation, social outlook. And what's the name of that social outlook? According to Sarkar, neo-humanism. So neo-humanism within this model is the outlook. And the final factor of the six, socioeconomic theory. You can see that it's, it's, it's sort of moving from the abstract to the very, very concrete and very practical and actually the very collective level. So this idea of socio-economy, how society and the economic system needs to function if that society is to fulfill its proper purpose. And we've identified that proper purpose as being facilitating um, human dharma, allowing humans to develop it um, at that highest level. So the social and economic dimension has to be there. It has to be given its proper place and proper importance. So these are the six factors identified by Sarkar. And neo-humanism actually is one of those factors. Uh, relating to social outlook, the way we come to understand our relationship with what is beyond ourselves. That's the world, the creation, and of course, other human beings. So these six factors for social development, uh, one way I like to look at them is within a spiral. So we see guide as being the, the stage where we get um, literally guided back to that nucleus point, back to that, that cosmic nucleus. Here would, of course, be supreme consciousness. And then coming out from that, we have the practices, we have the philosophy, an integrated vast philosophy. We have the guidelines, those practical guiding points, the do's and the don'ts of our lives. It has that social outlook, that expansive guiding point for how we are to view the world around us and our place in it. And of course, socioeconomy. Humans are collective beings, they're social beings. We live collectively and we're gonna have to have arrangements at the level of, of society and economy that can facilitate the all-round development of its members. These are two, I think, important concepts. The idea of movement towards the nucleus is centripetal movement, and movement away from the nucleus is centrifugal movement, centrifugal. So it means moving towards the periphery. So within this model, this is essentially a, a, um, a spiral. The ultimate journey is back to the nucleus. But there are forces within this creative cycle itself that are centrifugal, that actually take us away from the nucleus and move us to the periphery. 
though the overall, let's say, in inverted commas, programming of this creation is centripetal. It is inward moving. It is nucleus seeking movement towards the nucleus. It's a little bit difficult to see this diagram, but what it's done, it's, it's introduced the idea that there can be a type of inversion of these six factors. And an inversion of these six factors will mean that the, the socioeconomic level is not guiding people to the nucleus. It is not centripetal, rather it's doing the opposite. It's carrying people away from the nucleus. So it's saying here in this inverted uh, idea, you can, you can have a socioeconomic system that actually carries people away from the nucleus. You can have a social outlook that always also carries people away from the nucleus. You can have guidelines guiding people's behavior within a society that also carry people away from the nucleus. You can have philosophies that have that same effect, actually centrifugal, where the effect is to carry human beings away from that nucleus. You can have practices that carry people away from the nucleus. You can have guides that carry people away from the nucleus. So that is now recognizing there are two flows ultimately. One is centripetal, movement towards the nucleus. One is centrifugal, which is a counter force moving towards the periphery or in simple language, uh, crudifying. It's a crudifying force. Why I put that in there is in many ways, this is what we're really talking about today in the context of what this conference is about. So we now identify there are literally centrifugal crudifying forces at work. So th that's a list of, of, of these inverted uh, factors. And there you see it in the, in the uh, spiral. So from my personal perspective is that the socioeconomic system today is in its, in, its, in its regressive state. And it is literally moving the society to the periphery. It is crudifying the society as are all these other factors. So that's a simple way of understanding what's happening. Uh, we have a society where the our dharmic forces means the opposite of dharma is called our dharma. These are the regressive forces or the negative forces have managed to gain control of the socioeconomic system and are now orientating the society towards crudification, centrifugal movement towards periphery, the crudification of the society. Sarkar, in the future also for want of the six factors of development, the extinction of a concerned group of people is sure to happen. What this is saying is where these six factors are in a society, that society will thrive, that society will realize its innate characteristics, its innate purpose, and it will endure, it will thrive. And then it's saying in contrast, where one or more of these six factors are absent in a society, its extinction is sure to happen. He, he then went on in this particular uh, discourse to look at a number of societies that had reached quite developed points and then were quickly lost into the dustbin of history. 
where these factors are present, there the movement is towards divine bliss. And due to this movement, the chance of their elimination becomes nil. So the sentiment here, the way I take it is, if these six factors really are capable of helping human beings realize human purpose, realize human dharma, then it's worth us exploring them and ultimately looking at how we can bring them into implementation. So these are these six factors again. And here we have the socioeconomic uh, dimension, which we'll look at in more detail now. Okay, within this neo-humanistic outlook and related uh, thoughts of Sarkar, he identified four dominant psychologies in human beings. So four types of mentalities of human beings. This is to say all human beings fall into one of these four psychologies. Okay, the first psychology is that of the laborer, the second that of the warrior, the third that of the intellectual, the fourth that of the merchant. So each human being, according to this idea, will fall into one of these four they may have tendencies towards more than one, but in the end, one will be stronger than the others. One will predominate. So Sarkar then went on to say that three of these four psychologies will gain sufficient collective strength to form a society um, over which they prevail. That is to say, the warriors at a certain phase in human history will have emerged, uh, mobilized, gained collective strength, and come came to dominate the society, forming the warrior society. That society would rise, it, and it would inevitably reach its pinnacle, and then it would move into retardation or degeneration. At the phase of degeneration, um, the conditions were made for the next social psychology to rise. And in this model, that is the intellectual. So the intellectuals would form out of the demise of the warrior society, and they would come to predominate, and they too would suffer a similar fate. They would reach their apex and fall into degeneration characterized by the exploitation of the mass of the people. And out of that degradation, retardation, the conditions are created for the next social psychology to attain power. And that in this cycle was the merchant. So the merchant would then rise and then it would reach its apex and then it too would fall into the phase of retardation of degeneration. And at that point, conditions would be created for the oppressed within that merchant system to strike against the power of the merchants and shift the social cycle forward. And here it would go on to the warrior. And it would be facilitated by effectively the revolution of the workers. They would not hold the power of the society, it would pass back to the warriors. So this is what Saka called the social cycle, that it's essentially cycling through these different social psychologies. Now it's, I think it's fairly obvious which so psychology dominates uh, most countries of the world today. And of course, that is the merchant. So we are living in the age of the merchant. It is merchant power. It is merchant control. It is merchant domination. 
So what we saw in the previous presentations all can be contextualized within the system of merchant control, merchant power. So this social cycle can be depicted in wave form. So we see here it's moving from the laborer to the warrior, the intellectuals to the merchants, and then it would repeat itself. So this is simply a wave, a diagram of that same concept of the social cycle. And there you could see it continuing into its uh, second cycle. So this looks at a bit more detail on what these dynamics are. We have these intellectuals uh, and intellect, the power of intellectuals is generally expressed through the priest class. So the society dominated by intellectuals is usually under the control of the religious uh, figures, the priest class. And this is showing here its transition into the phase of degeneration or retardation, and then in moving into the next phase of the social cycle, here being the merchants. Okay, what are the dynamics by which the society may move from one um, phase to the next phase? Here it is showing uh, the application of force, which we may term evolutionary change uh, through the application of force can shift that social cycle from the retardative phase to the phase that follows it. Now, when it came, and this, uh, this social dynamic here is depicting the application of tremendous force. And the word uh, Sarkar used for that was revolution. So revolution was the application of tremendous force to shift the social cycle. Now he believed that the transition from merchant, the merchant phase of degeneration to what would follow it in the cycle being the warrior phase could only happen through the application of tremendous force. The previous cycles and their transitions may be accomplished through natural change or, for, or through evolutionary change being, of course, the application of force. But he believes that the transition from the merchant dominated system in its phase of degeneration to what succeeded it as the warriors could only happen through the application of tremendous force. The word for that being, of course, revolution. To eliminate merchant exploitation, the application of tremendous force is absolutely essential. So that's something to keep in mind, given the fact that we are today in the merchant system, the merchant era. And I think we'll all agree that we are definitely in its phase of degeneration and its phase of retardation. Okay. Sarkar then went on to elaborate a concept of leadership. And for, for this category of leaders, he used a word called sadvipra. And this is essentially meaning spiritual revolutionaries, or that is one translation we can take for this word. Such groups which have the six factors in their possession will be able to produce sadvipras, these spiritual revolutionaries, these personalities that have realized the highest form of engagement and occupation of one's life is service to the society. It's that point of dharma, that third point of dharma, selfless service. So these are revolutionaries dedicated to the well-being of the collective human society and indeed in the spirit of neo-humanism to the living world. Sadvipras are those whose all efforts are directed towards the attainment of bliss. They don't lack in the six factors of development. They're strong in morality and are all, always ready to wage war against immoral activities. The word immoral that he used, I would interpret in this context as being all forms of exploitation. 
Okay, so we now can have this new category called Sadvipras and Sarka using this idea of a cycle, place them in the center of the social cycle. And in that center position of the social cycle, they would be able to view the society, monitor the society, and where any of the ruling um, social psychologies went into the phase of degeneration and started to exploit the people, exploit the masses of the society, the role of the Sadvipra then was to create the circumstance to shift that social cycle. So we're understanding why we can see uh, this category as Sadvipra in the, in the sense of, of spiritual revolutionaries. Spiritual here is meaning consciousness, who have understood the ultimate journey through the creation as coming from supreme consciousness and going back again to that supreme consciousness. Possess the qualities of all four classes, plus spiritually developed with a willingness to sacrifice for the good of the whole society. That's another way of understanding this idea of Sadvipra. They are to possess the qualities of all four classes. The, that of the warrior, rather that of the laborer, that of the warrior, the intellectual and the merchant. They are to cultivate, actively cultivate all four qualities in themselves. They are to develop themselves physically, mentally, uh, emotionally, physically, emotionally, mentally, and at the consciousness level, and willing to sacrifice for the well-being of the society. This is a new idea of leadership. Okay, putting it within the contemporary context, we, it was suggested we're in the merchant era and that era has gone into an advanced stage of degeneration, of retardation characterized by the mass exploitation of the people. So it's, it's showing a society that's stratifying into a class of the super rich. This is based on the work of Professor Guy Standing of um, University of London. It's, I've modified it, in fact, uh, but he identifies um, a salariat class, a proficient class, um, and then a class of what he calls precariats. I've called them here wage laborers where what's happening is the other social psychologies under the merchant control, that of the warriors and that of the intellectuals are being reduced today to wage laborers. So we're getting this enormous uh, development of effectively a wage laborer class. And it's including your traditional laborer uh, class of people, but it's also full now of, of warriors and intellectuals. So the warriors who, who were pursuing professions like the military, like the police, these type of roles are being reduced to wage laborers. Um, the mercenaries who are deployed into Afghanistan, deployed into Iraq, um, just to be paid, paid mercenaries. They've been reduced to laborers. It's a little bit hard to see this diagram. In the white circle here, we have the intellectuals. So what's happening here is the intellectuals and the warriors are being aggregated into one class of laborers and they are becoming disgruntled workers. So this is a dynamic that starts taking place in the advanced stage of degeneration in the merchant era. So that's what According to this analysis, we are witnessing today. And it is that uh, category, that class of disgruntled warriors and disgruntled intellectuals that will have the means to strike at merchant power. And there is the hope. From this perspective, that's the hope. So, you know, we've talked in the conference today about so many expressions of deception, of manipulation, of 
incredible, almost incomprehensible exploitation that is being rolled out at accelerating speed today in the world. According to this analysis, the defeat of those agendas, the defeat of those forces will come through these disgruntled workers. And it will be when the and the intellectuals who have been reduced to nothing more than wage laborers and look around your society because that's what's happened, whether it's journalists, whether it's academics. They're being reduced just to wage laborers. you tow the line of the corporate or governmental entity that you are simply a functionary of. So the qualities of the warrior, the quality of the intellectual has now been deployed exclusively to the agenda of the merchant elite. And there's no more evidence of that than the pandemic itself and how the pandemic has rolled out, how the vaccines have rolled out. Who are the personalities behind this agenda that are being put in the face of the public? And, well, they are the merchant elite. In fact, a major uh, figure within that category um, was last year the biggest funder of the World Health Organization. And that was, of course, Gates himself. So within this context, these sadvipras, these spiritual revolutionaries are essential. They need to be created. We need to create ourselves as sadvipra, as spiritual revolutionary, people who are involved in the process of developing ourselves at the physical level of our physical health, our physical well being, in all its aspects, at the emotional level, touched upon by earlier speakers, clearing out those accumulated uh, emotional traumas that we've carried on and on and on in our journey. Um, at the mental level, the expansion of our mind and ultimately the experience of our true self as pure consciousness, carrying with it the potentiality to merge again back in that source consciousness, that supreme consciousness. So finally, to end now addressing the question, can neo-humanism free humanity from emerging totalitarian systems? Actually, the answer to that to me is actually alone it cannot. It is a social outlook. It is a worldview. In my opinion, it is extremely expansive, a inherently benevolent worldview and extraordinarily powerful because of that. But alone, it cannot do it. There are other factors. There is expanding our mind to understand this bigger, deeper cosmic purpose of our human lives for which guide has to play its role. There is a need for consciousness practices for that physical, emotional, mental consciousness development of each human being. We need those practices. We need a sublime, expansive philosophy, ideology to understand at the most expansive, vast level what this creation is about from where it comes, where it is going, what is our place in it. And we need those guidelines to, go, to guide us as, as individuals living in collectives. What will I do? What will I not do? And we need that expansive social outlook which expands upon that humanism, that liberates humanism from the pseudo-humanism that the vested interests have reduced it to today. And of course, we need transformation on the socioeconomic level. We need movements, we need mobilizations that can lead to the liberation of human beings on that level. We've got a few minutes now for some questions. So I'd like to end the presentation now on that note and open it up to questions if we have some. Yes, Dada, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, there is a question here. Can we then say that transhumanism is a kind of centrifuga movement and thus in opposition to neo-humanism? 
Can we understand transhumanism as a, a what? A centrifugal move, movement. Centrifugal, absolutely. I mean, okay, I would say, I would place transhumanism within a category of technology. Technology may be used in a benevolent way, in which case we would say it was centripetal in its movement. It was dharmic in its movement. But in the wrong hands, that technology may be used to exploit human beings, exploit the living world, and thereby degrade the society, cause harm to the society, in which case it would be centrifugal or ardharmic or regressive. Mm -hmm. Another question, where does the transhumanism fit into this cycle? I, yeah, I pretty much touched on it there. It's from this perspective, it's who controls the technology. If you're going to put the technology, whether it's vaccine technology or gene therapy or any other type of technology in the hands of private corporations whose stated objective is maximization of profit for stake, uh, shareholders, you can guarantee that that technology is not going to be used fundamentally in the best interests of humanity. It's going to be used to uh, deliver profits to corporations. So where transhumanism fits within this outlook is Again, if that sort of transhuman, if that if technology itself is in the wrong hands, it's going to create a disaster. It's going to enslave people, and that's what we're facing today, uh, in the merchant era of degeneration. It will enslave human beings, but the neo-humanistic perspective does not deny technology, but it places it in that vast context. And it keeps in mind that the ultimate purpose is that development, all round development of a human being. And nothing should be entertained that would disturb that, that would compromise that. So in that sense, it's all about balance. Another question is how do we unite moralism? In my opinion, that's, we're getting a lot of help in doing that today uh, through the vehicle of pandemic. It has succeeded to wake up an entire vast class of humanity today that eight, uh, 19 months ago were not thinking like this. We're not questioning the system they were living in. We're not questioning the government. We're not questioning the experts multi-millions of people today as a result of this, uh, this uh, pandemic have now become awakened. It has started a tremendous movement and our job each as progressive individuals is to keep that movement going. We've got to learn a lot as we go along on, on the way. And then the other thing I would say on this point is Let's not forget the role that warriors are going to have to play in this. According to this cycle, if it is correct, the warriors will succeed the merchants. I think we all know the control held in the hands of the financial oligarchs today. They own the political system. They own governments. They own media. They massively fund education and have influence in it. Um, they aren't, they aren't going to give up that power easily. So the role of the warriors, these dispossessed laborers, wage laborers, reduced to wage laborers, they have a dignity that is being trampled on and they will awaken. They are awakening. So this has to be a type of um, alliance between different groups in the society. There is the oppressed laborer class. There are the, the disgruntled intellectuals that have become wage laborers of the merchants. There are the warriors who are now just the paid mercenaries of the system. There's an enormous potentiality of unity 
and remember the outcome of that was striking at that force. Not, not only can this happen, this absolutely will happen. Um, it, it's, it's destined to happen, but we can't sit back. We have to be active participation, participants in this and remember those factors of this uh, six factor system. We need to have that connection with that guide, with that, uh, you know, that ultimate supreme guide. We need the practices that will elevate us, that will give us the mind and the strength to engage in the sacrifices that are needed. Um, and we need that ideology also. Yes, thank you very much. Well, one more very nice question is um, how to teach uh, spiritual practices or practices for awakening consciousness in an inclusive way? In what well, means in a world that where there is diversity, how can we actually teach it in an inclusive way? Well, you know, ultimately we get guided to where we need to be on that point. That's my personal experience. Um, develop that inner desire make the effort to understand this big picture view. It's not easy to understand, you know, what, what's being shared here because we don't think like this. We don't get the chance to think like this, but orientate yourself to that. Understand that there is a purpose in this creation. We, this is not some random movement here. There is a purpose and uh, there is a guide helping us in that journey and develop the desire to find that pathway, find those practices, and it will come to you. And, you know, that's been my work for 28 years now. And I say that based on a lot of experience. The first thing is cultivate that interest on a more practical and even mundane note. Um, I'm impressed with, with one YouTube channel that explores practices in this regard, and I can recommend that to people. Um, and it is called Meditation Steps. It's on YouTube, and it takes a very integrated viewpoint. And I think it's very compatible with this particular neo-humanist approach. Okay. Can I do a, a, a one more, one or two more questions? Um, fine with me. <laughs> so if we are if we don't belong to the warrior class can we though uh, cultivate the warrior spirit anyhow absolutely you know the the thing i find inspiring in this model is this idea of the the spiritual revolutionary this sadvipra and the idea there is cultivate each of these qualities that of the laborer go out and do laboring you know experience it enjoy it do the work of the warrior uh, cultivate the bravery and the courage within ourselves and life will put us in situations where we get that opportunity cultivate that of the intellectual you know make the effort because we have all these capacities within us Cultivate also the ability of the merchant. None of these psychologies are wrong. It's not a question of them being wrong at all. It's a question of when they come form a society and move into the phase of degeneration, then they become a problem and they have to be stopped. And that is the world we're living in today. So let's go out and cultivate each of these qualities, expand our understanding through this this, this sublime uh, philosophy, ideology, do the practices and, and become this spiritual revolutionary. That's what the world needs today. It needs these people strongly founded on a moral foundation. And, and this is only just starting to really come into the picture. We want a better society. We've got to create ourselves as better people. And then we've got to unite. Mm. Another question is how can we get back all those disgruntled workers that uh, have become apathetic 
angry and only want to destroy or just uh, think about their selfish purposes. Uh, how to change that? You know, I believe there are millions of, of actually intellectuals in the world today and they are disgruntled. It was never only about the money for them. They have a, a vision of their role, of their contribution to society. It's exactly the same with the warrior. So people who are genuine warriors and genuine intellectuals feel it when their roles get reduced to that of a wage laborer of some corporation or some corporate dominated government. They feel it. So you don't need to create that. They already have it in them. They're only waiting to find others. They're waiting to hear a call of rationality that makes sense of the play we're in. And that's a big part of what we are having to do today, expanding our consciousness, expanding our understanding, putting all the pieces together within a very big picture. We need rationality. The days of superstition and of dogma, whether it be a religious dogma, whether it be of scientific dogma, these are gone. They're in their death throes. The new wave, the new flow in the world is integration. It is rationality in its highest aspect. And that call is being heard in the hearts of human beings everywhere. They are the ones that are feeling this um, degradation of the society. And they will stand up, but we've got to do it together. We've got to unite. We've got to talk. We've got to connect, communicate, and network. This is a historic moment of transition of, of, for humanity, absolutely historic. And, and we are part of it. We have turned up here for, at this critical time, and we will rise to that occasion.